As long as you are attached to any model of the universe, to any level of definition of who you are or how it works, you are closed off from the rest of it. And the state of no mind, the Buddhist state of no mind, is where you have finished with models. You don't even be enlightened, you don't be anything, there's just no mind. And because you don't have any models, every moment is a totally, look, I am making all things new, said Jesus. It's all happening straight all over again because you didn't have a pre-fixed model that you're just reinforcing or rejecting. Hello, amazing ones, and welcome to another Ramdas Here and Now episode. This is number 242, The State of No Mind. And it's taken from a Ramdas talk at Colby College in Maine in April of 1970. And it makes me wonder, what would it be like to fully live in the Tao? To fully trust that intuitive knowing completely? And to just sort of constantly, moment by moment, let go of what we know ourselves to be and how we think of the world into sort of a greater perspective. And I think probably many of us get glimpses of that from time to time, either through meditation or psychedelics or, you know, crocheting, breath work, skiing, rock climbing, whatever your method is. This state where the mind stops pulling this way and that and just for that split second comes to rest. And then we are sort of able to touch something beyond our normal state of consciousness. You know, the Buddhists, um, I think they call this the state of no mind, which is what he's talking about in this episode. Um, you know, and it's the Yoga Sutras uh, go to great pains to describe how to get to this state. Even though uh, we all probably glimpse this state of mind from time to time, I think for most of us, it's just fleeting. Almost immediately, our perspectives come back into play. It's almost like we're addicted to our perspectives. We believe something, and then we collect evidence to reinforce that belief. Sometimes it's an idea about ourselves, our sense of worth or enoughness or capacity or sense of separateness. You know, Sometimes it's about other people and how we judge them and who we believe them to be. And, you know, it's bigger too. It's our politics and our religions and just how we think the world works. And that's what this lecture is about. That's what Ramdas is delving into, this habit of perspective. You know, I think scientists might call it belief uh, perseverance or maybe it's even neuroplasticity. I know the yogis called it samskaras and vasanas. And, you know, Ramdas does this brilliant thing he always does is he holds the paradox this how it's so natural to have perspective and so natural to cling to it. And yet by doing so, we limit our own capacity to really know the fullness of ourselves, to know the world. Um, and so he does this as always with these wonderful and wild and deep and even challenging stories. And he does it with such humor and clarity. So we hope you enjoy and get something really brilliant from today's lecture. And you have a chance to share your own perspective about perspectives at the upcoming Soul Pod meetup. And this is where we practice together. We practice meditation and chanting, and we practice being together in community, sharing our stories and listening to each other from the heart. And this practice of satsang, it's a big part of what Ramdas wanted his legacy to be, to continue into the future. And it only happens when we show up. So take the plunge. It's 75 minutes of your day, once every two weeks. And all you have to do is go to ramdas.org slash fellowship and sign up, and then you will get the invitations. As always... We hope you are well nourished by this episode and these teachings and whatever good comes from them, may they benefit all of us in our daily lives and ripple out into the world for the benefit of all beings. So here is Ramdas, here and now. Namaste and blessings.
gaining perspectives about your own life is not easy because whatever perspective we have is designed to perpetuate itself. by reinforcing positive instances and rejecting others. So, for example, when I was a behavioral scientist, strange as it may seem to some of you looking at me up here in this weird scene, If I studied some personality variables and I got a correlation of 0.5, which means 50%, which means a correlation of 50, which means that I had explained 25% of the variance, meaning 75% of the relationship between these variables I didn't know anything about. I would interpret that, of course, as error or as poor instrumentation that I had operationally defined my variables correctly. Or that I hadn't measured enough of the variables, multiple variables. I never thought my theories were wrong. Or that I was concentrating on the wrong level of the game. Because my perspective as a social scientist was self-perpetuating. Then my mind got blown by drugs. And then for years I was in the drug mythos. Now all I mean by that is not that psychedelics didn't play as crucial a role in my journey as they have, and that I, and I certainly honor them now. But that, as the Vedas point out, every method has within it a trap, whatever it is, because you tend to get hooked on your method. Tend to get hooked on your method. Call it your method for getting high. Everybody's got a method for getting high. Some people, it's books problem solving, some it's sex, some it's surfing, some it's going off by themselves in nature, some it's meditating, some it's doing pranayama or breath control, some it's turning on. Whatever your method, there is a tendency to get hooked on it and say, if your method sex, you say, hey man, you don't, you're not into sex, baby, where, where are you at? You must be pathological because I get my kicks from it. A scholar, to see somebody who doesn't read books, just feels that it's very poignant. Because that's his trip. Now, there's nothing wrong with everybody having a trip. In fact, doing your thing is absolutely the optimum, harmonious living in the Tao. You're a tree, you, you, know, you bud, and then you leave, and then you drop your leaves, and then you wait around, and then you grow another ring. And you just do your thing. You give shade, nice to lean against. You don't collect kudos for it or anything. You're just doing your thing. And if you're water, you do its thing, your thing. You flow downstream. You don't say, shall I flow downstream today? You don't fear getting to the bottom of the stream. You're just flowing downstream because that's your thing. And as man learns to live in nature, he starts to listen to the harmony of it all to see exactly what his thing is. Is his the design of a man to be a pollutant? Is the design of a man to up-level himself, to make himself an anachronism? Is the design of a man to enjoy himself? Is 
the anthropocentric, it was all designed for man's pleasure? Is man merely food for the moon in his magnetic field? Gurdjieff says that the body nourishes the earth, the magnetic field of man nourishes the moon when he dies, and his consciousness nourishes the sun. That's interesting. All perspective. All perspectives. Like, what are we doing here at this moment? Who are we? Who, who, who did you think you were when you walked in here? Who did you think you were, and what did you think you were coming to do? I'm sure any of us could just calm down and project himself into each of the rest of us and pretty well come up with a reasonable set of descriptions of why people would say, I'm going here at 8.30. Having a perspective or having a thing is, as I say, very harmonious. Being addicted to it or stuck in it is quite another matter. Or being under the impression that it is, quote, reality. Quite another matter. That is, I can sit here and talk to you as long as I equally know that there is no one talking. I can listen to you when you speak as long as I realize that there is nobody listening. The minute I forget that, either in either direction, either forget that there is nobody listening or think that there is nothing to hear, I have lost one half of the, of the wisdom of the ages. The minute I get hooked on sanskara, the minute I get hooked on form, on maya, on the divine mother, the minute I get seduced in again into the the experiencer of bliss, the divine duality, dualism. As soon as I forget that my father and I are one, as soon as I forget the unity, then I am never wise, I can just be knowledgeable. See, I can look at this evening as here we are, we are all consciousness, see? except the consciousness is vibrating at a certain frequency, which we'll call this plane. We'll call it the gross physical plane for fun. Okay. And in order, at this level, the consciousness manifests in different ways, which is really a different sort of description of a set of unfolding karmic potentialities. And so when I look out, when I look out, I see I looking out, and I see all this, and I see this spirit or consciousness just manifested in a multitude of forms, including the microphone in the building. And I think, wow, man, the Divine Mother really comes in some far out forms, doesn't she? You drive, walking through New York yesterday, I look at a big garbage truck coming down the street, and I say, oh, wow, I love you, Divine Mother. Garbage men look at me like, you know, um, there's another one of them. <laughs> you don't go worshipping garbage trucks, <laughs> haven't I told you? <laughs> Recently I was in Los Angeles. And it was a very far out night, and Los Angeles is kind of a cult city. Um, it's sort of, a, it's a totally astral city. I mean, everybody knows it's all made of cardboard, you see, so it makes it very easy. Uh, but it's a weird occult city, and cultish also. And um, very many people are into the model of dualistic, like worship or something like that. So I did my thing, and I... I get very high off all the energy of the scene and just went out and out and everybody got a contact high from it. 
So they all figured, wow, you know, there he is. <laughs> so instead of realizing that they're the one that's a high, they attribute, you know, like it to me. So they came up afterwards, and about 200 people were standing around, and they started to come up and touch my feet. I was just meditating. I was just sitting in this place. This was about midnight at the Unitarian Church on Vermont and 8th in Los Angeles. <laughs> And here's a good Jewish boy from Boston sitting up here, cross-legged, you know, and thousands, you know, like, not thousands, hundreds of people are coming up to touch my feet. I go, oh, wow. I just... <laughs> Father Coughlin and all, all possible trips, you know. <laughs> Big Billy Graham never had as good as this. Because <laughs> he couldn't allow himself to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Just another addict. Addiction is a very serious problem in our culture. <laughs> um. Well, after these people had, um, I sat meditating and I realized that, see, in India, it's perfectly all right because when somebody, the first, when somebody touches your feet, because you're dressed like a sadhu and you are a seeker, you don't rebel or revolt or anything. They're honoring that in you, which is what you're working to become. And if you were out of the illusion, you'd realize you were it already. And they're just helping you do your trip by reminding you who you are. They're honoring that in you, which is the high place. And at the moment when they do that, they are giving you pran, and at the same moment, they're taking pran from that place in their minds. They're, they're creating their universe. You can create your universe, so at the same moment, you are honoring them. You're honoring, you're touching their feet in your head, in your heart. You're honoring them. You're honoring the God in them, because there can be no difference in role, ultimately. We're, we're all consciousness, just manifest in different forms. But as I sat in Los Angeles, you see, it's a completely different setting, culture, motivation, and I went through a number of trips watching this process happen. It was like um, an interesting thing happened to me in India. Um, I was sitting at the temple one day. I was very, very high, in a very high state. I had been doing a lot of meditation and fasting. and um, I was at the temple, and I was... Uh, in a very low state of samadhi, very low, but waves of bliss and so on. And uh, I felt these hands massaging my legs. I came down into form to experience this happening. Well, that's a weird experience. You know? You're sitting alone out under a tree, and suddenly you feel this. And I sort of half opened my eyes, sort of see what it was about. And there were these two old people who were making a religious pilgrimage to the temple, and they had seen a sadhu sitting there meditating. And they came over to do their part to make, you know, to loosen up your legs and relax you and honor you and do this whole process of helping the work, since you are doing the thing. And they were doing it with absolute purity of intent, and I just was over... It was like they gave me a huge shot of spiritual energy, just, ah! And I closed my eyes, I never met them, I never saw them again, so. And then about a month later, I was down in uh, Borelli, and uh, I was at the train station, going to take the night train to Delhi. And um, it's very uh, far out scene, it was mobbed, and you get, we were in the lowest sphere thing, where you sit so that maybe in a little space there, a little tiny car there, maybe... Uh, a hundred people, and you sit right crammed in with your knees up, and you go 14 hours at about 18 miles an hour. See, And there's just so much frustration you surrender into it, which is exactly what you have to do with the Divine Mother in India. You just have to, oh, right, oh yeah. Because if you sit like, you know, it's all horrible, you can create a horror for yourself. And I was kind of looking forward to this, and um, a coachman from the train, a baggage master, came along and he said, um, sadhus, American sadhus, <coughs> from America, yeah. He said, uh, 
empty baggage car for you. Ruby took us and put us in an empty baggage car they weren't using, and there we, he said, I won't let anybody in here, just you two. I thought, gee, that's very nice. It wasn't exactly comfortable. There were these little things in the thing to hold the bags, but you could find a way. Closed the door, and we were sitting there meditating as the train started very slowly, and he said, when I want to come in, I will knock. So and he knocks, so we let him in at one of the stations along the way. And where I'm meditating, and my guru brother lets him in, and I'm very comfortable going along with the train, and I suddenly feel his hands massaging my legs. I think, oh, wow, it's happening again, man. <laughs> too good. It's like two sauna baths in one week. You know? <laughs> and it's very uh, like bathing. It's very high. And I was just starting to enjoy it, and I suddenly felt that his hands were going higher and higher up my legs. See? Until finally he had my genitals in his hand. And suddenly, it took me a long time to come back into this other model of what was in his mind, what his intent was. He was both worshipping me and enjoying me. And all I did was I made myself like a statue. I mean, I just left my body, and then it's like he's making love to a dead being. And since that wasn't his trip, you know, he just sort of lost interest. And then he filled the car with other people all night long. You know, I can't keep it for you two. And he, just made love on the upper tiers all night long. <laughs> now you go up there. Now you... <laughs> Very far out scene. Um, but what it did was it gave me, uh, you know, I, that second take on somebody working, their hand, working your legs with their hands was the model that I would have started with in America. Immediately would have been a sexual overture. Then the older people showed me another perspective, and then when I try to generalize that perspective, of course, that was wrong, too. So I'm in Los Angeles now, and Los Angeles is like in the railroad car. You know, I can have people touch my feet, but if, if their intent was pure enough, but obviously there's a lot of funny games going in all of our heads about things like that. Finally, I just stood up and I looked at everybody and I said, well, everybody, that's showbiz. Right? <laughs> And I walked off. <laughs> That's what I mean by perspective. See, whatever model you came in with, came in here with in your head as to who you were and where you were going and where you are when you're here is definitely the wrong one. Just because it is one. And as long as you're not hooked in it, you can move from level to level from an But if you're hooked on it, it's too bad. It's just very poignant. I went to, uh, recently, I went to the Boston State Hospital to their heroin addiction center. It was an afternoon staff meeting of about um, 30 heroin addicts and about 30 staff members, psychiatrists and social workers and so on. And I came in and I sat down on the floor and um, everybody sat in chairs. even the heroin addicts. <laughs> and um, I started to talk. And after I had done my thing for a while, people started to ask questions. And the psychiatrist asked psychiatrist-type questions. And the heroin addicts asked heroin addict-type questions. <laughs> and I answered holy man-type answers. <laughs> But then I noticed quite a, an interesting situation, that I could say what I just said, and that there were a goodly percentage of the heroin addicts in the room who could say what I just said. But there were very few of the psychiatrists who could say what I just said. And it suddenly dawned on me that the psychiatrists were more addicted than the heroin addicts. <laughs> addicted to being psychiatrists. And this was a hard take for me because I had come to study the addiction problems. 
<laughs> I suddenly looked in a heroin addict's eyes, and here he was. And it, now he wasn't on heroin at that moment. And if he was on heroin at that moment, then he'd be like a psychiatrist. <laughs> he'd be having none of it. I mean, the psychiatrist was completely freaked by me because I was talking all that other talk, you know, crazy talk about astral planes and psychosis being an addiction to the wrong plane of reality, you know, getting hooked in some other place. Some of you are here because you're collectors. Collectors. Are you collecting knowledge? How about experiences? Collecting experiences. This may be a high experience tonight, you never know. Collecting tapes. How about that? <laughs> to raise hamsters and they just no matter how much food you gave them they kept collecting it pretty soon they had to climb all these huge i just kept giving them as much as they wanted they kept pretty soon they had to climb over huge mountains of stuff just because they couldn't stop collecting <laughs> if you gave it to them they collected it's like god and satan walking down the street and god kicks something and he picks it up and satan says what is it you have there sir and god says i that's true Satan says, well, here, give it to me. I'll organize it. <laughs> That's where institutions are at. You can be part of them as long as who you are isn't part of them. If you get stuck in any perspective, just so poignant. Because all collecting, I, I dug on the way over here, I was thinking about schools, and I thought of the term, what is Colby? And I thought, what went through my mind was a finishing school. See? And then I thought, well, what does that mean? Is that pejorative? Is that a terrible thing going up and saying to everybody, you're at a finishing school? I thought finishing with what? See? I knew it meant finish like starch, you know, finishing the things you could do your thing, you know, like preparing, finishing, socializing, acculturating, you know, getting you straight. But I took the other meaning of finishing being ending. And I saw that what school was speeding up was the process of your finishing with it. And what you're finishing with is attachment to the external. Attachment to the external. Attachment, as Buddha would say. There's a term in Hindi, uh, in Sanskrit, called virag. Virag is, there's many, many translations of it. One of them is um, unworldliness. You could almost say naivete, but it doesn't mean that. It means being free of worldly things, being finished with worldly things. Like, um, I, I had a motorcycle. And I drove the motorcycle, and I drove the motorcycle in, up in Stanford and Palo Alto and up into the hills behind the campus and along the ocean on the sand in the middle of moonlit nights. And I did hill climbing, and I did the whole motorcycle trip. You do. We went on, you know, trips and trips and trips and trips and trips and until there came a point where the motorcycle just sat in the garage, and when I go out, I get into the sports car instead of the motorcycle, right? Because I'd sort of had it with motorcycle. I mean, in the last, you know, one, 
one night you're driving down from San Francisco and it's ice cold and you've got a New York Times you bought just to stuff in your jacket because it's the thickest one. <laughs> and a bottle of brandy in you. This was in 1953 or something. A bottle of brandy in my hip, and I'm driving, you know, and it's freezing cold, and I think, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> yeah, is this what it's all going to be about? And in a way, I was sort of done with motorcycling. I still, it's groovy to go out on a nice day and motorcycle, but the thing is, is done. And the same thing happened with me with airplanes. I had a little airplane and I'd fly in dangerous things and through thunderstorms. So finally, I'd just be sitting over Salt Lake City, you know, at 100 miles an hour where you, nothing's happening. You just go up four hours, you ride, then you land, you go to the toilet, have a milkshake, get in the plane, get up, go four hours, land, go to the toilet, have a milkshake, get up. <laughs> it's not nearly as interesting as driving, you know, because it's all flat, you know, there's nothing interesting happening at all. So you sit and you read, you know. You think, well, I could be reading at home. What's this all about? This is flying groovy. Okay. And then I'm finished with flying. See, and one by one, I get finished with things. When I'm a child, I play with childhood toys, and then when I grow up, I sort of get done with them. Car is an interesting one. A lot of people go through that for years. You do a whole lifetime on that one. Till finally a car becomes a means of transportation. It's a strange time when you, you, know, you just want it not to squeak and not to stop. And you know. I've been driving around the country in a 1938 Buick limousine that I got made over. I live in it. It's a beautiful old car. It weighs 6,000 pounds. And it goes 50 miles an hour. It'll go faster, but it's so, it's, she's 31 years old, you know, and you don't like to push her around. And I just drive across the country, and all day long you don't move, you just sit there, you know, just sitting in this big monster, and the movie goes by, it's Cinerama all day long, and <laughs> you know, stop, and then the next day you go. And everybody loves you, you see, because you're a universal symbol. See, old people like you, and... I drive uptown, see, I go from the Lower East Side, and all the hippies, hey, baby, that's a cool short. Get to Midtown, all the taxi drivers like you. Because you really know cars, you know. And they say, straight eight, and you say, original. <laughs> right, there they are. <laughs> and the little old ladies in the back of the cabs like you because they're, they had one. Or, <laughs> You get up to Harlem and, hey, baby, dig that shot. You know, <laughs> there it is, too. Wow. Universal symbol. And then um, I started to do this other, this very fast traveling now, this other game. And for this game field, uh, somebody gave me a, a Jaguar saloon, right? It goes like a hundred miles an hour when it's happy. You know, anything less than that, it feels like it, it rumbles. <laughs> you know, because you're not letting it do its thing. Suddenly, I'm driving a car. I'm totally paranoid all the time. You know, because I'm going a hundred miles an hour now. <laughs> and everybody's looking at me like I'm I'm decadent wealth. You know? <laughs> And it took me a while to go and go and go and go and go and go until I realized that there was no longer anywhere to go. Because wherever I went, I was always right here. That takes a lot of, hey man, let's go. Mm. You bet. You went to Toronto to the... Mm. Mm. How about the... What do you say we... That, that whole thing in people. Keep moving. It's somewhere else. It's out there somewhere. The 
and you drive along until suddenly you've done every take of yourself driving along. You've done them all. You just keep doing take after take. You see? Like I can see us as sitting around a campfire like we've been sitting for thousands and thousands of years talking about what this is all about and how it happens next and so on. In an age-old ritual, we've all been involved in talking to ourselves about how it all is. It's a place halfway along the race before you. I can see this as some central casting setup. And all of us are just characters cast for our part. Send over 500 interested looking college community type, right? One holy man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Special rates on me other than Christmas season. <laughs> Not much call <laughs> during the rest of the year. Uh, We're all of those things, at least. We're all of those things, at least. I once went to the ballet to see Nureyev, and I went high on LSD. It seemed like the suitable way to do that. And um, I sat in the orchestra, and it looked to me like all I saw was that he was pure form. There was no ego. It was just that he was perfect form. When he came down into being Nureyev, he was a drag. But when he was like doing his thing, he was absolutely pure state like uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphs. So a few months later, when the opportunity arose again to go to the opera for the opening of Lincoln Center, I was very delighted. And I went. And this time we sat in the... Uh, horseshoe, the circle, the dress circle. So you look down on the stage. And now I again took LSD, figuring I would repeat this experience of pure form. And now I look down the stage and all I saw were a lot of people hopping on the stage and they looked like birds that hadn't yet, they were trying to fly except the species hadn't evolved quite far enough and they kept jumping up and falling down and jumping up and falling down. <laughs> And the thing about a finishing school is it keeps feeding you, it uses your intellect to feed you perspectives until you're done. Television does roughly the same thing. It does it very intensely, in fact, somewhat more intensely. You see, television will take you through hundreds of role models you can vicariously live out. And the thing is that television is so seductive because it deals with your senses in such a way that you really get into it, so you really do use up the role. So a 12-year-old kid, he's already been um, can be a president of the United States, and he can, you know, he can be being killed in Vietnam. He can just stay glued before the blue tube, the boob tube, you know, and he can just collect and collect and collect and collect until he's finished collecting, until he's used up. He's used up. And you can't say in the little town I live in in Franklin, New Hampshire, you can't say to somebody, some kid there, what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> because that whole model fell away somewhere along the way because it's all being grown up is already 11 years old. The kids already lived out all those adult roles. That's what Virag is about. It's about what Virag is about. Virag is using up a certain kind of a trip so that you get to the point where, as Gurdjieff says, the only way a person can hear a new system is when he realizes he has no more cards left in his hand. If he thinks he has cards left in his hand, forget it. For example, if you're sitting here now evaluating whether you're going to believe what I say, well, I've come to hear him. You've created a situation in your head where you can't hear because you've made me him.
if you can risk opening yourself to every experience saying, well, where are we at now? And realize I'm part of where we're at. Just as you are part of where we're at in my universe. I can open myself to you. I trust the fact that in me is something which knows. I am willing to trust intuitive validity. Even though I can look at all the psychological data about distortions and illusions. The only thing is that the psychologist is an illusion himself. And therefore, in a very vicarious, very delicate position to measure illusions. Ramakrishna says, you cannot straighten somebody else's scales if your own scales are unbalanced. As long as you are attached to any model of the universe, to any level of definition of who you are or how it works, you are closed off from the rest of it. And the state of no mind, the Buddhist state of no mind, is where you have finished with models. You don't even be enlightened. You don't be anything. There's just no mind. And because you don't have any models, every moment is a totally, look, I am making all things new, said Jesus. It's all happening straight all over again because you didn't have a pre-fixed model that you're just reinforcing or rejecting. Tim, my old partner, Tim Leary, used to say, isn't it too bad that everybody sits up in the steering compartment of the ship, steering the ship, and nobody's down in the hole dancing? It's like everybody's read the Titanic story so often, they're all like looking for the icebergs all day long. You know, and the whole ship is up there looking for the iceberg. And nobody's like, wow, well, yeah, here we are. I'm a tree. Look at me, bud. You know, what is the implication of trees budding? <laughs> <laughs> and the bridge is what we call our knowing we know place. It's knowing you know where it's at. Don't you want to know where it's at? See, that's what... The thing is, what cool means? Does cool mean knowing you know, or does cool mean being wise? See, wise people don't necessarily know they know, they're just wise. You can meet some little old lady in a little village in Italy who is uh, whatever, you know, with ten children and chickens and a saint. And you're just around her, and when you're around her, when you meet her, you just know she knows. It's just wisdom. She's exuding wisdom. She's a harmonious being. She's doing her thing. And sometimes without attachment, most of them aren't. She's wise. She's not knowledgeable. She can't tell you what she's doing or how she does it. I used to be a child psychologist, and I would be dealing with many, many mothers in studies of mothers and children that I used to do with Bob Sears at Stanford. And I dug that some women knew. They just were, the, they were mothers. They were harmonious mothers. And yet they couldn't tell you anything about what they were doing, just like you can't tell me very clearly how you make a fist. or how you wipe yourself on the toilet, or how you do a thousand other things, which you do day in and day out, and day in and day out, because you're not doing them at that level. You could call it a base brain operation. It's the way you drive a car. You drive a car, but at the same moment you're driving, like I can drive a car, and at the same moment be looking out for police, and for radar traps, and and be thinking about, and saying mantra, and uh, listening to rock and roll music, and uh, digging the day, and looking at cars going by, and the faces of people coming by, and doing, oh, level after level after level after level. And at the same time, my foot's going down the accelerator and the brake, and I'm, I'm responding to all of the vibrations of the road without ever thinking about any of that. I'm not saying, now ease your foot off the gas. Now you're going around a corner, you better pull into the left. In fact, the research data on driving is very clear. The safest drivers are base brain drivers because thinking about it slows down your reactions. The reason there are so many accidents among young kids is they think so much about it. 
And thinking is always like one millisecond or whatever it is away from here and now. If you don't know it until you've conceptualized it, you, you couldn't get up out of bed in the morning. And those that didn't aren't here. <laughs> Just like you're stuck in a model like you're seeking, because if you knew, you probably wouldn't be here either. Because once you know, you know, you don't have to come and collect more. I don't have to come listen to me speak. <laughs> it's like reading books for me now. I read books as affirmation. I don't read books like, I wonder what he says about that. I read books, and if I read it, and I say, yeah, right, that's the way it is. Boy, we sure say it beautiful there, don't we? Knowing you know, or seeking, or any role at all, is just another hype. It's just another hype. It's another mind trip. And you will keep tripping until you're done tripping. And I don't mean it chemically. I mean it in the life sense of creating models and living them out. You can watch it sometimes. Those of you that have ever smoked pot do a lot of mind tripping. You go on different mind trips and you collect, you go into a trip. Somebody says, it's all blue. <laughs> and you're all, everybody's on the trip of it's all blue. And somebody says, gee, I'm hungry. And then suddenly everybody's hungry and pizzas and, and big boy burgers and it's all like, you know, your head's just full of pickles, pickles, oh, pickles, ice cream, ice cream. Oh. And the interesting game, see, is to be right in the middle of that and then say, wow, that's where that one's at. Center so perfectly that you can see food trip. Food trip, food trip, food trip. <laughs> okay, which trip should we go on today? Thumb through the book. Okay. Curious and knowing trip. <laughs> That's a good one. That'll get me to class. They're all okay. Nobody's knocking any trips. Just that it's all the Divine Mother. You don't knock the Divine Mother. You just like make it with her. But at the same moment, you don't get seduced into the illusion again. Because it's all equally real. All equally real, because it's all illusion, because all form is illusion. I lived in an academic community for a long time, and I was around a lot of people who collected knowing they knew. The problem was, no matter how much they knew they knew, they still felt empty inside. And there was all this bizarre neurotic behavior. Everybody was showing extraordinary pathology, because they felt that all I had to do was do that thing harder to get rid of that gnawing thing inside. So if you read one book a week, read three. I mean, maybe it's in that one. How about that one? Have you read? No, I haven't. I'll make a note. Ooh, wow. Collect, collect, collect. No, you know. Because that one must lead to it. The problem with the using the senses or using the thinking mind as a nupaya or as a method for becoming enlightened is that you get highly addicted to your means of getting enlightened. I used to spend a lot of time with Aldous Huxley in, back in the early 60s. And Aldous was totally addicted to knowing he knew. He was so far beyond having to be Aldous Huxley. I mean, he wasn't hung up in his lower level ego games at all. He'd done all that. But he just couldn't stand the exquisite blissful delight and just give him just orgasmic joy, total, total mind blow, practically anything. So he'd walk around and he'd wave him and he'd say, he'd say, all oh, this, this cow just shit in the ground. And he'd look and say, extraordinary. <laughs> Now, he's not saying extraordinary at any one level. He's seeing the whole level. It's like always eating baklava, you know? <laughs> like a many-layered strudel. It's just layer after layer after layer after layer. After layer. <laughs> Everything you look at. Why? Yeah. I once did a book on LSD with Sidney Cohen, a, a, a hustle book, you know, a big picture book. <laughs> and um, this was a very funny situation because Sidney 
was uh, head of the VA in the psychiatric research installation in Los Angeles, and I was uh, thrown out of Harvard, uh, you know, drug user, poor dick, what happened to him type thing. And um, uh, this super hustler, Larry Schiller, who's a photographer, uh, an L.A. photographer who plays many notorious roles in many games. Uh, he looks like Dr. No. Doc, he looks like Goldfinger, is just who he looks like. Uh, he, he came to me in an acid test one night, and he said, would you like to do a book with Sidney Cohen? I said, well, Sidney Cohen isn't going to do a book with me. I mean, he's got all his cards in his hand to protect. He can't afford that. He says, oh, yes, we'll do a pro and con book. He'll do it. I said, delightful. It was great fun. So we arranged to meet at Larry's house in Los Angeles Hills. We went in and Sidney was sitting there in a tie and a suit. And I came in slouching, you know, doing my thing. He was doing his thing. And uh, except we both came in Volkswagens, which shows something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they're very shifty, those <laughs> universal symbol makers. So he sat down. He says, "Well, now we have a serious responsibility here." I'm like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> he says, "Well, I think uh, we really must do this book with a great deal of." I said, "Well, that's why I'm doing the book." He said, "Well, why are you doing the book? I said, I'm doing it to make money." And there was a moment of look as two members of the Jewish tribe looked at one another. So. <laughs> and he says, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Living out all our delightful stereotypes. <laughs> Again. <laughs> so then we went to take pictures. See, and he'd take all the pictures that make at, uh, taking LSD look like... Uh, like uh, something out of Dante's Inferno or, you know, a Hieronymus Bosch thing, you know. And, <laughs> and I picked all the pictures of people in fields playing flutes and stuff like that. <laughs> but there was one picture we both picked, which was very far out. Just one out of the whole scene that we both picked. And that was a kid. Um, he was on the floor on his uh, elbow, I think, and he was looking at a spilled Coca-Cola bottle. And he was looking at the spill right here on the floor, and he was just like that. Sidney picked it to show, like, the irrelevance of it all, see, and how acid makes you, you know, blows your mind. <laughs> like, you want your kid looking at spilled cartels? <laughs> you can go through a, a college career in, in a number of different... Um, postures. The posture I went through was I was scared of the whole thing. I felt like I was a phony and therefore I was always frightened and I was running out of fear of failure all the time. So I studied because I had to study because I couldn't be a dismal failure. That was my trip through college. So most of what I remember in college was sitting in the toilet having diarrhea. <laughs> anxiety attacks about failure. But it was a great motivator. It got me all the way to being a Harvard professor. Be frightened enough. But always around me at college, and then later when I was a teacher, I would meet these kids who knew just what was happening. They had the whole thing in a perspective that made them say, look, I want to know this now. I've got to get this thing straight in my head. I'll collect this a little bit now. No, I'll do this. No, I don't really need the grade on that. I just need to know this particular thing. They were just finishing off places. They were cleaning up loose ends of stuff. They were trying to see how it all was at other levels. And they pick and chose, and they didn't fulfill any of my motivational analyses of students. Because they apparently didn't care, and yet they were clearly turned on by certain things. But you couldn't make them play the game. 
because they didn't have the same motivation I had. I had this very interesting sequence of experiences, which I think I may have, I don't know whether I told on a tape that's been around here or not, but um, at one point I was a therapist at Stanford, and my first therapy patient was a, um, what in those days is called a beatnik. And he came in, and he had dirty feet, and he put them up on my desk. And I was a budding young graduate student psychologist, therapist at the health service. And I had my pad and pencil. And he would put his feet on the desk and put his feet against a potted plant that was there, and he'd slowly edge it towards the edge of the table through the whole hour. <laughs> and just as it would go off the edge, I'd pick it up, just as it would go off the fall and move it back on, and I never said anything, and he never said anything. No. <laughs> Well, after a number of months of our playing out this game of sick and healthy and so on, he turned me on the pot, which he was, uh, I guess he took pity on me. And um, that was my first uh, time I turned on. That was in 1954, I guess. And um, so I started to hang out with his friends because I was, of course, the healthy and he was sick so he would write pornographic literature that nobody would print because they said it was pornographic and he was just writing how it was but and um, he was very rebellious and dirty and all that and I was a psychologist and he was in the literature department well in the course of the years that went by he transferred into psychology and he got a Ph.D. And uh, in 1966, I was up in San Francisco, uh, and uh, I borrowed a motorcycle, and I went down the peninsula. I borrowed one of the Hell's Angels, actually. And I went down the peninsula, and I went to look up my old friends, and I found out that this fellow was now a psychologist, and he was working at the health service. <laughs> And I came in and I asked to see Dr. Lovell, and they said his office was right there. And I knocked on the door and he came in. And he was, I walked in, I sat down. I was been driving the motorcycle with, you know, barefooted all the way down, see, dirty feet. And I was like, I put my feet up on his desk, and he was sitting with a tie and a jacket and a pencil and tape. We looked at each other, and it blew both of our minds. <laughs> Mary, a word was spoken. <laughs> <laughs> now, who progressed? Yeah. Who wins? Who loses? Does anybody win? Does anybody lose? Is it just process? Is there as much of the universe coming into form as there is going into formless? This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening, and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.